Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, there's two verses I want to talk about today because they tend to get taken out of context uh, by the lost professing Christian world and sometimes by us Bible believing God fearing men and women. If you hear a little bit of chirping we're going to try this out. Um, I got another video that's going to be coming out soon. Um, I uh, hatched some baby chickens so I'll get that out shortly. That's what I've been really busy with the last month. And I don't know if I'll do a uh, up close picture. I might. This is a wall plug in, and half of it melted while I was in the wall, and black went upside the wall. And my house could have burnt down, but the Lord blessed me and saved me. So, yeah, there's a lot of things I've been dealing with this month electrical problems, storms were coming through. Um, so, let's get back to doing some Bible studies. So, turn to 1 John 2 1. 1 John 2 1. I've had someone tell me this before. I got into, gosh, it's been a while, under one of Brother Brian's videos over at King James Video Ministries, and I came across some comments where people were saying, present tense, that Jesus loves you, and they were trying to witness to lost people online, and they're telling them that Jesus, present tense, loves you. Okay? And one of the verses they came back with to prove this was 1 John 2 1. So let's turn to 1 John 2 1. Two things that I've learned when I first got saved, one of the things I've learned is is context. That was the first thing I learned is you gotta make sure you're getting the context. Okay? Um, I was taught, never even heard of it, but taught dispensational teaching. So we gotta make sure dispensational it's for this time period, this dispensation from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. Um, and um, if you're going to apply it to today, the other thing that this big with this ministry is that words have meaning. Sometimes people will try to change the definition of a word um, or try to replace a word with another word that doesn't mean the same thing. So let's remember that. So 1 John 2, 1. All right. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Little children. Uh, he's talking to saved people. Okay. That ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. I'm going to stop there for a second. So, so far it's addressing saved sinners. Okay. That we sin not. We have an advocate and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word we're going to be looking at is propitiation. Remember, when you're lost and you get saved, I believe that all gets erased. God washes that clean. Now that you're saved, from that point on, you're held accountable to your life as a Christian. That's why we have the judgment seat of Christ for saved sinners. Okay? And when you sin, the Bible, I didn't put this in here, uh, says that he is faithful to forgive. All right? You just have to ask and God is faithful to forgive you. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ. All right? But let's look up the word propitiation. This has to do with words have meaning. They'll take that word propitiation and say, see, Jesus, present tense, paid for your sins. Present tense. He paid for your sins and he loves you present tense. All right? Propitiation, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. The act of appeasing wrath and conciliation, conciliating the favor of an offended person, the act of making propitious. Making propitious. So it's an act that you're in the process of doing. You're in the process of making propitious. Remember that word. Uh, definition number two in theology, the atonement or atoning sacrifice offered to God to assuage his wrath and render him propitious to sinners. Propitious to sinners. Render him propitious to sinners. See, he paid for the, sin, for the sins of the world. He did. He bought that debt, and we'll be talking about that. But what does the word propitious mean? It's in both definitions, and you have propitiation. It's a branch of the word propitious. So the word propitious, disposed to be gracious or merciful. Disposed means ready. He's, he's available to be gracious or merciful. Ready to forgive. Ready to forgive. Not that he forgave in past tense or present tense. You're forgiven. 
He's ready to forgive sins and bestow blessings applied to God. That applies to both saved and lost, as we're reading here. The lost world, salvation. Jesus is ready to forgive them of their sins, but they have to go to the cross. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. You have to ask God to save you. He's ready to save you if you're lost out there. He's ready to forgive your sins. But you don't tell somebody that you're witness to that Jesus Christ, present tense, paid for your sins. He took on the debt of sin. I've talked about this before in other studies. Um, right now, this truck, I own my truck. This is the title to my truck. Okay, I own my truck. But before I owned my truck, there was a loan. And the bank owned my truck. It had my name on it, but they owned it. They got to say what happened to it. They, if I didn't make my payments, they can come and take it from me. Same thing with the house, my mortgage. If I don't make my payment, even though my name is on the house, it's on a title, but the title has a lien on it. In other words, someone else has owns the debt. I have to pay it. Okay? And when I've had my mortgage, it switched hands multiple times. From one bank to the next, they'll sell it off to another bank. They'll sell it off to another bank. And... I'm just going over this. I've already talked about this in other studies. But bottom line, Old Testament, before the death of Jesus Christ, we owed God a debt. Now, Jesus is God. Don't get me wrong. But just bear with me a little bit. We owed God a debt. Okay? Jesus came along and he paid that debt. We owed him a debt. So he came along. He sacrificed on the cross now he bought that debt. Guess what? We owe Jesus Christ. Everybody on this planet owes Jesus Christ. Remember by him all things consist. He's the lifeline of everything on this planet. Okay? He created all things. So we owe him a debt. So when you're preaching the gospel and witnessing to people, it's not a good thing to tell them that Jesus Christ, present tense, paid for your sins. Now I'll link us to Pardon me. I'll link a study that Brother Brian did a long time ago. The King James Video Ministries. Um, Does God love you? I think it is what the video was, uh, study was. And it was a really good study talking about if you're lost, God does not present tense love you. God's wrath and God's judgments on you. That's what hell's all about. If you don't preach hell, when you're witnessing to people, you don't love them. You're supposed to be warning them. What's the whole concept? If you're just telling them Jesus loves you and Jesus, present tense, paid for your sins, what's the point of getting saved? All right. So that's one verse that people were taking out of context. Remember, words have meaning. If you want to turn to 2 Peter 2.1, I had a brother in Christ use this on me also uh, to try to say that Jesus, present tense, paid for the sin, our sins. Okay. So 2 Peter 2.1. One. This one, <clears throat> been trying to get over sickness too, so I apologize for the throat. This one would have to do with context. <clears throat> we just used one where people were taking, uh, going the wrong direction. People were taking a word and changing the meaning. They were saying propitiation means that he present tense paid for your sins. That's not what it means. It means he's ready to forgive your sins. The atonement was made and now he's ready to forgive your sins. You have to go to the cross. So 2 Peter 2 1. <clears throat> we're going to start there. But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you. Instruction and righteousness, we apply this today, but a lot of people say this is directed today. But I'll, let me finish. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. They'll grab that and say, see, deny, even denying the Lord that bought them. Um, context. Who is Peter written to? The Jewish people. Let's go back, um, just going back real quick. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, 
and Bethany, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Okay? You keep going down. Okay? You realize uh, it's taught, he's addressing, and I'm going to get to this, he's addressing the Jewish people, but what I believe that's going on here in First, Second Peter is that it's talking, Peter's talking about different dispensations. He talks out about the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He talks about um, the true gospel for today. All right. But if you keep reading, because people stop there, okay, the, he, um, the denying the Lord that bought them, Okay. There's a verse that talks about, let's see if we can find it real quick. I didn't have it in here. Second Timothy, Second um, uh, Timothy 2.11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he is, uh, abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. Okay. A Christian can fall away from the Lord today, and he won't lose his salvation. And this dispensation, death of Jesus Christ, to the catching away of the body of Christ, um, being caught up, Someone can fall away from the Lord and make a mess of their life as a Christian. But they can't lose their salvation. And as we read there, uh, it says, Denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now let's keep reading real quick. People don't like to keep reading. 2 Peter 2, 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of who the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned word make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slubbereth not. Okay? Swift destruction. What's that talking about? I believe it's talking about hell. The damnable heresy that it's talking about there. Uh, what, in the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year period after the catching away of the body of Christ, what's the one thing you're not to do? The number one thing, you're not, two things you're not supposed to do. They go hand in hand. You're not to take the mark and worship the beast. There's people already today, instruction righteous, there's people already pushing it today, but when the catching away of the body of Christ happens, and people get saved during that seven year period, you're going to have people come along and say, hey, you can take that mark and be a Christian, it's okay, you can take the mark and be a Christian. We have people saying it today. It's going to be a hardcore thing in the time of Jacob's trouble. And when you take that mark, and you worship the beast, swift destruction. You're damned to hell for all eternity. All right. And we're going to get to that as we go down a little bit further. So as we read the context, I believe, at this point, we're getting to the time of Jacob's trouble. Now I want to go over just a few things in Peter to show different dispensations. Okay. All right. Now merchandise of you, when I talked about that in here, um, I want to throw out there in the past, before the Catholic Church became, it was the Roman uh, paganism, and it's still Roman paganism today. It's not Christian, but they try to disguise it as Christian, call themselves the Catholic Church. They still have the same sun god that they worship, the Eucharist, all that stuff. But before that, they had the Colosseum, and people would pay, I believe, and, you know, they had food, uh, drink, and entertainment. Does that sound familiar today? Only the main thing for the entertainment was they were killing Christians. They had lions, all kinds of things. They were killing Christians and making merchandise out of it. Is that going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble? Absolutely. I believe that 100%. That it's not just that people are going to, we're going to find you in the forest and cut your head off right there. I believe there, a lot of them are going to be made example of. They're going to strike fear in people. They're going to use them as entertainment. People who get saved and kill them for entertainment. Okay. So there's that part. It's kind of there. But if you turn to 2 Peter 1.19, go back to 2 Peter 1.19. Remember, I'm saying this is kind of the time of Jacob's trouble. So let's go back a little bit to 2 Peter 1.19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. What's that talking about? 
and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the pri prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I believe he's being warned, the Jewish people are being warned, Jesus, the, um, until the day dawn, the day of the Lord is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. It's going to dawn, you know, and we're going to keep reading here. It's going to talk about how it comes as a thief in the night. <clears throat> so this is talking about, hey, this time of Jacob's trouble. You got to be careful. Hey, you don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. And people can say that's a little shaky. Let's talk about... Um, the actual day of the Lord, and we're going to talk about the new heaven and new earth in Second Peter, Second Peter three ten. And ten. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Mm -hmm. Seeing then that all these things shall be observed, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Remember it says day of God, not day of the Lord where the heavens sh being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heaven and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And this is at the end of, of uh, Peter. talks about the new heaven and new earth. Now, I can't say for certain that it's chronological. It starts with, you know, talking about the past, the Old Testament, uh, this dispensation, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, then the thousand year reign, and then the new heavens and the earth. I, I can't say it goes in chronological order. I haven't studied that hardcore. I'm just throwing this in there real quick to say, hey, there's different dispensations in, in the book of Peter. So to grab a verse from Peter and say, this is for today. People can deny the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Where at in the Pauline epistles does it say that? That someone can deny the Lord and lose their salvation. Where's that at? Okay. It's not there. So you got to be careful trying to grab that verse and apply it today saying, well, Jesus paid present tense for the sins of the world. If Jesus paid present tense for all the sins, it's not a past event. He didn't buy that debt. He didn't take on the debt of sin, you know, the punishment of sin that I should have paid, that you should have paid, brothers and sisters in Christ, then what's the point of the great right throne? It's paid for. Your debt's wiped clean. You're good to go. It's not paid for present tense. Okay? You still owe, if you're lost, you still owe Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that real quick. I wanted to go a little bit more. If you want to turn to Matthew 18.23, just to get this whole debt thing taken care of and understanding what it means when someone owns the debt and has the right to say, Pay me or forgive me, or forgive you. You pay me, or I can forgive you. Forgive that debt. So Matthew 18, 23. Now I believe this is more for the uh, thousand year reign. But for instruction righteousness, I can apply it to the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, and I'll explain why. Because has to do with instruction righteousness, Jesus has the debt. It's his choice. He gets to do with it what he wants to do with it. If he wants to forgive you, he'll forgive you. But remember, it says he's faithful. He's ready to forgive. It's not one of those things where he's like, I don't know if I want to forgive you or not. He's ready to forgive. But he's the one that does the forgiving. You don't turn around and just say, well, I'm forgiven because I say so. Or misuse scripture and say, see, my sins have been paid for, present tense. I'm forgiven. All right. 18, verse 23. I'm going to read all the way down to 35. 
Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servant. Kingdom of heaven is a reference to the here's here is a reference to the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. It was the king's choice. He's the one that that servant owed. Mm -hmm. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Same situation's going on. Okay. In other words, that servant now is the one that owns the debt. The person that he's going to is the person that owns him, owes him. Okay, you owe me that money. Hopefully I'm not using the wrong word. You have the debtor and debt E, and sometimes I get them mixed up. Okay. But bottom line, now the servant is the one that says, Hey, someone owes me money, I'm gonna to go to him and get my money. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went out and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Mm -hmm. uh, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then the Lord, after that he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Okay, notice what it says there. Thou desirest me. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay. 33. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the reason I pointed that out, desires me, in other words, the servant didn't desire him anymore. He went out and started doing wickedness. And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. We'll get back to that one. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother his tre their trespass. Time of Jacob's trouble, it's about works. Jesus Christ is physically present. You can see him. It's not about faith. It's about works, that thousand year reign. When that servant came to him and owed the king, he desires the king and said, you know, please forgive me, give me time, I, I will pay all it. Okay, and the king forgave him. Then he didn't desire the king anymore, and he went out, and he was wicked. He didn't show the same mercy and kindness that the king showed him. He didn't desire the king anymore. So what happened was, and the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors. How does that apply today for instruction righteousness? There's a cost of sins. The wages of sin is death. Hell is a real place. It's where you're going to be tormented. For all eternity, wailing and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness, okay? um, until you pay that debt back. Can you pay for your sins? Absolutely not. You'll be paying for all eternity okay? till he should pay all that was due unto him. But as we read in here for the thousand year reign, Jesus holds that debt. He's the king. He's the one that rules and reigns. He's the one that does the forgiving. Okay, he can forgive, or he can say uh, you're going to pay for it. Same thing in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, he can forgive. Only thing with time of Jacob's trouble is you take that mark of the beast, and worship the beast. Now you owe you that debt again, fully and completely. Okay, right. so I just want to throw that in there real quick. These two verses. Make sure you're careful in how you use these verses, and be careful with going to. First and Second Peter, and trying to apply a lot of that stuff today. Like I said, there's some of it in there that is applied to today. I believe there's stuff in there that's applied today at the beginning. But you're getting to Second Peter. It's getting into the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. It's getting into um, Jesus coming back. It's getting into the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. It's getting into the new heaven and the new earth. So you got to be careful of trying to use that verse to try to claim uh, that Jesus Christ bought and paid for the sins, present tense, of the whole world. Okay, denying the Lord that bought them. Uh, 
The Bible says to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay. People will grab that. That's for today. Absolutely. Okay. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, like I said, you can lose your salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. In the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, you can lose your salvation. This just showed it. The guy was forgiven, and then he got said, okay, well now you have to pay it in full. Okay. You can lose your salvation in the time, uh, thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. You can lose your salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. You cannot lose your salvation today. So don't draw from a verse, um, 2 Peter 2 1, that talks about how you can be uh, swift destruction and talks about uh, damnation going to hell because of it. You don't really want to use that verse. All right. So remember, if anything, walk away with this, uh, not just with these two verses, that when you start doing verses and studying verses, reading verses, trying to put together gospel messages and everything, uh, when you're witnessing, make sure that words have meaning, that you're using the proper definition of the word. One word can have multiple definitions, but you've got to make sure the context, which is the second part, lines up with the true definition of the word, and make sure you have the proper context. All right. I was witnessing to some uh, Jehovah's Witnesses came to my door, um, and um, I wasn't feeling very well. I was in my sweats, and uh, they started talking. So I walked out there. I saw them coming. Thought they might have been Mormon, but I grabbed one of these gospel tracks that uh, Brother JT made, and I walk out there and listen to them. And I started quoting the stuff that uh, Brothers in Christ praise the Lord that do videos to help uh, warn us and help teach us about things and. I can't do it off the top of my head, but the verse in Revelation that talked about who was dead and is now alive, talking about God, um, when was God dead, and I, I, he kept trying to grab from Matthew 24, I said that's written to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, and he just had no answers, he was just fumbling all over himself, and I, I remember saying, hey, I'm going to give you this, and he's like, oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, you can't take this, can you? I was told by people that used to be in Jehovah's Witness and people that have dealt with Jehovah's Witnesses a lot. You're not allowed to take this. Oh yeah, I have, he, this guy, oh yeah, I have the right to take it. I can take it if I want to. And I said, okay, then here, take it. No, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. He lied. He's a liar. Um, and these people are trained to lie to you. But when I preached to him, I said, hey, you need to get saved, you know. I talked about the cross and said, you need to go to the cross. You need to go to the real Jesus Christ, not a Jesus Christ, not your antichrist posing as Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of Scripture. Okay. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. you got to preach truth and make sure not to take it out of context. They can use it against us, brothers and sisters of Christ. I've seen a lot of people look at false converts and false teachers and say, and, and yoke Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women up with them. I've had people that are truly saved make mistakes. I've made mistakes. Okay, We come out and we repent, and the lost world will jump on that mistake, and they'll hold on to it forever. And we can repent a million times, and to them it doesn't mean anything. But to brothers and sisters in Christ out there, it means a lot when we come out and say, Hey, I was, I was wrong about this passage. I made a mistake. You know, so... So that's going to be it. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.